All right. Well, what you should have is you should hopefully have two handouts. There's one that's a guide that is nothing but genealogy resources. And that's not the one I'm going to talk about today, but I want you to have it so that, you know, as I'm mentioning things or if there's a particular topic you're interested in that I don't talk about today, you've got those extra resources available to you. But the handout for today is going to cover things like Ancestry and Heritage Quest, but then I'm going to talk about free websites, maybe some state websites that you haven't taken advantage of in the past. Um, so just briefly for a couple minutes, I want to talk about what the difference is between subscription databases and free websites. So beyond the fact that one you have to pay for to access information, there's a couple of things, nuances um, that separate free websites from subscription databases. So besides just requiring a fee to access free web, uh, subscription websites, like some of the ones you have through Danville. So you have Heritage Quest, which I'm going to talk about today. You have Genealogy Bank, News Bank, and you've got newspapers.com. So some of the things I'm going to mention, you might already be familiar, familiar with that you've used through your local library. Um, some of the other ones maybe you haven't used before, like Fold3, which is military records, or Find My Past. Um, but what sets these apart from free sites are the fact that because they're by subscription, they're making materials available to you that you don't have access to through any other source, especially a free source. And because they want you to subscribe and they want you to use these resources, they really try to go out of their way to be responsive. So if you find a problem or an error, they're usually very quick to fix whatever the issue happens to be for you. One of the downsides to a subscription database is these are multi-million dollar corporations. So they're not necessarily people from within that community that are working on those records. Um, so while you're looking at an original digital image of something that they've had the ability to scan, the transcription of it or an index or an online search tool for it might not, not always be so reliable. And that's one of the downsides to that is that if you have somebody in New York who's transcribing and putting together a database for Oklahoma, they might not be familiar with the community, they might not know the surnames, they might not recognize the, the streets or the rivers and those things. So sometimes there could be errors in that transcription or in that index because they're just not familiar with that particular area. It's great that we have access to original digital images and I'm looking at the document that my great great grandfather might have signed or the military discharge papers of, you know, Uncle Bob. But if the transcription isn't great, it doesn't really help all of that much. Um, now, the difference between that and free websites is the fact that with free websites, it's usually people from within that community who are putting these records together online. So they're familiar with the surnames. They're familiar with how surnames are misspelled. They're, they know the, the geographic locations. So the databases and the transcriptions are usually very, very reliable. The downside to free websites are typically they don't have the resources to be able to scan them and put original digital images online. So you'll have a great index and a great transcription, but you might not have the original image. They can run the gamut from people who are complete novices to people who are experts on that topic or that geographic region. So sometimes you have to kind of look at the website and see they might be really, really good about church records in that community, but they might not be so great about military records in that community. So you want to see what their strengths and what their weaknesses are when it's a free website. Nonprofits usually, because they're run by, by volunteers, might have indexes and abstracts up online, but they might not be current. So for example, they might have, like our library, we've got an OBIT index up that goes up to 2017. We have OBITs after 2017. So if somebody called us or emailed us, we could give them a copy of that OBIT. We just haven't had the money or the resources to be able to go forward. So when you're looking at some of these free websites and it says, you know, they've got phone directories online to 2012 or an OBIT index online to 2019, they probably have the information. So if you reach out to them, you can get a copy of it. They just might not have the ability. Their webmaster might have left and they haven't had the ability to update the site in a while. So always keep in mind that if you find something on their website or there's a broken link, you go to click on the contact us page or the email bounces back. 
doesn't mean that the society has gone under or that they're no longer active. I would look for them online, usually Facebook, even though my local historical society doesn't have a website. I know it's 2023. They still don't have a website, but they have a very, very active Facebook page. So if I need any information, I know I can always reach out to them through Facebook or by giving them a call. So Sometimes the information might not always be current, but it's spot on and it's very accurate. Um, just look past those, those date ranges and reach out to them and ask, what else can they provide? It doesn't hurt too for you to volunteer your time with your local group too. If you do have those expertise, we are always looking for them. Another one of the downsides is that if there's an error, it's not always very easy to figure out who to contact, or again, if they don't have somebody who has the computer skills to fix the mistake, that mistake might stay, um, but still it's always wise to just reach out to them and let them know that there's a problem. So I'm going to talk about just a handful of subscription databases today, and they might be databases you use all the time. Um, but I want you to look at them in a different light. I want you to look at some of the things that they have to offer that maybe you haven't accessed before. So in the library world, there are library editions of websites and there are .com editions to websites. And what that means is Ancestry.com sells subscriptions to individual users. So I can go and buy what is a very expensive subscription to Ancestry and every year I'm going to pay that fee. And that gives me access to additional information that I don't get through a library edition. Library editions always have less because they want you to subscribe. They, they want you to get the extra bells and whistles by paying for it yourself. So if your library or a library near you or National Archives Facility, Family, Re Family History Research Center, local historical or genealogical society has access to Ancestry, they're most likely getting the Ancestry Library Edition. So places like National Archives has what they consider to be the not-for-profit version, which is Ancestry Library Edition. So you would have access to viewing family trees, but you wouldn't be able to comment or email or reach out to somebody through it. You would have access to hundreds of databases covering all kinds of genealogical topics. Ancestry to me, I like to consider to be like the Walmart of the genealogy world, where I can go to Walmart and I can get my tires rotated and I can buy groceries at the same time. Ancestry is kind of that way. There's a little bit of everything. I can look at church records. I can look at occupational records. I can look at censuses. I can look at military records a little bit of everything, and a little bit of everything kind of scattered around the U.S. and some of Canada, but not too much. Whereas the other, the next few websites I'm going to talk about are going to be more boutique, where they focus on one particular topic. But Ancestry is kind of a catch-all um, for your general searching. They're always making updates and changes to collections. So on the toolbar across the top of the page, there's a little button that says um, new, and that's everything that they've added or changed within the last 90 days. So for example, they find an error in a database and they make an update to it. They correct a mistake. Then that goes into that new column of changes and updates they've made within the last 90 days. Some collections are only purchased from the owners for a certain number of years and they fall off after a while. Ancestry doesn't just keep adding. There are things that get removed over time as well. Like Cook County records um, for Chicago were removed not too, uh, several years ago. So it's always evolving and it's always changing. So if you haven't used Ancestry in a while, it doesn't hurt to go in and look at that new and see if there's anything that maybe you wanna check. Oh, there's an update to the 1950 census. I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna take a look at it. But I think what they're really strong in is their, their help center, their charts and their forms. So if I need a blank form for a family tree, or I need a blank form for the 1950 census or a family group sheet, I can go into Ancestry's help features and I can download those forms so that it makes it easy on me instead of having to search online for places. I can just go and download the form I need to keep track of my family tree as I'm working. 
And they've got a lot of videos and they've got a little a lot of cheat sheets to kind of help you with whatever the topic is. If you're researching railroad records or Irish immigration or German church records, they have a learning center to kind of help you and guide you to find the information that you're looking for. The downside to that is it's only helping you with resources that Ancestry has. It's not telling you where to find German church records somewhere else. Just telling you where to find German church records within Ancestry. So it's always it's always an option. But I'm going to give you another one when I talk about free sites that's going to be more useful. The things we don't see because we're not subscribing to the .com, we don't get the newspaper and the obituary collections, and we don't get the DNA results in the contacts. So those are the only two things. But we get about 85% of everything else that Ancestry has to offer. You'll notice sometimes if you haven't used Ancestry in a while that when I do a search on that first homepage, it's not searching all of their collections. Ancestry has a bunch of collections that are kind of browse only where I need to be in the card catalog to be able to find them. If I just put in my surname on that first page, it might get missed by the collections that are just browse only. So how can we get around that? Just like at your library, you're looking for the new James Patterson book. I go to the card catalog and I do a search. Ancestry has a card catalog as well. And in the dot com, it's good. In the library edition, it's excellent because what do librarians do best? We love card catalogs. So the, the library edition of, of the card catalog is, is much stronger than, than the dot com version. But I can go into the card catalog and I can search for the name of the collection vast majority of us don't memorize the names of collections, um, but I can search by keyword. So I can tell it I'm looking for Chicago or I'm looking for Vermilion, and it's going to pull up anything that has that name in its collection, whether it's it's indexed, cataloged or not. So you could see here on the left-hand side, I did a search for Chicago, and it tells me that there are 90 collections that mention the word Chicago somewhere in their description. And it tells me what kind of category is it? Is it a census record? Is it a church record? Is it a uh, phone book or city directory? And then it tells me how many items are in the collection. So some of them are pretty small. So you can see that for the Peak and Railroad, there's only 2,600 items. But for some of them, they're enormous. So a million records from the Northwest Railroad um, employment records. So if I had somebody who worked for you know Northwest Railroad, this would definitely be a collection worth viewing. But if I were to just put my ancestor's name into the search box, I might miss this collection because it's not necessarily one of the five or six or seven most popular on Ancestry's page. So going in and browsing the card catalog can really help you find things you didn't know you were looking for. And you also have the ability to edit your search as well. So I can go in and I can tell it I'm looking exactly for this word or exactly for this title, or I can tell it look within a county. So it's going to look for anything within Cook County, not just within Chicago, or I can limit it to similar records or similar names. So by going in and then playing with the filters, I can narrow down my search results a little bit more. So I can put in, so instead of using Chicago, on the left side, I can tell it that I'm looking for 1950 census and I can make 1950 census my search. And then I can go into the filters and I can give it a location. So when I did a search for the 1950 census in Minnesota, nothing for Detroit Lakes came up. But by going in and, and clicking on the little pencil and putting Detroit Lakes in as my search, it brought up almost 6,000 records for citizens who lived within Detroit Lakes. So one thing we typically overlook when we're using Ancestry is to go into and really drill into these individual databases because you're going to find a lot more than if you were just putting the surname into the homepage on that first screen. Does that make sense for everybody? All right. So now Heritage Quest you do have, and I'm delighted to see that because I really do like Heritage Quest and I really do use it pretty frequently. Um, Heritage Quest I can use from home. I don't need to be at my library. Ancestry, I need to be at my library to access. Heritage Quest, I can be in my fuzzy slippers at nine o'clock at night searching away. Has the census just like Ancestry has the census, but it's not one of those sites like Ancestry where it's a catch-all. 
it's very specific in the types of things that it collects. So while I do have access to the censuses, I do have access to um, census maps by state so I can see how my how the state evolved over time. So for Illinois, it has maps from 1820 all the way up to 1930. So I can see how the counties and boundaries shifted, which they did a lot in the early history of Illinois. So I know I'm looking in the right county when I'm doing my research. Um, but they also have Revolutionary War land patents and bounty records. So if I know I had a Revolutionary War soldier, I could go into this collection and search for information about them. Um, they also have Freedmen's Bank records. So if I'm doing any research in the South, I'm going to take advantage of the Freedmen's Bank records, because even if I don't have African-American ancestry, even if I don't have um, former slaves in my heritage, these collections are vital because they're really neighborhood and community collections because for those freed slaves who wanted to open up bank accounts they needed to have somebody vouch that they were the person that they said they were because nobody had birth certificates this early there were no states that were collecting this information let alone if you were a slave so they would have to have people come and sign affidavits to say yes this person was born on this date this is the name that i've always known them by these are their parents or these are their siblings. And that could be a friend. It could be a neighbor. It could be a current employer. It could be anybody within the community who has known that person long enough to be able to vouch for them to sign um, the papers to create their account. So if I'm doing any Southern research, I'm going in and I'm looking for those surnames to see if they show up in this collection post-Civil War up until the 1880s. They also have what's called the U.S. Serial Set which is the congressional record. Um, so if I'm looking for early um, early military pensions were voted on in bulk 100 at a time by the U.S. Congress, which was only a part-time gig until the class of 1952. Um, and for those of you who are history nerds like me, the class of 1952 included John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. Um, it was a part-time job until then. So they would vote on pensions 100 at a time on the floor of uh, Congress. So you can find some of those early pensions being approved by Congress in the US serial set. So if you're looking for ancestors who may have served or who may have been a member of Congress themselves or who may have show, shown up in the congressional record because a street or a road or a, a day is named after them, it's worth it to go in and check and see if they show up in these collections. But Heritage Quest is really, really good when it comes to using the census, and that's really what they're most well known for. Um, you used to be able to do a really good granular search in Heritage Quest. Heritage Quest, which is owned by ProQuest, um, was bought out by the company who owns Ancestry Library Edition. Ancestry Library Edition is owned by a completely different company than Ancestry.com. And when Ancestry Library Edition bought ProQuest, they merged the search features. So now they look identical between the two sites, which is a huge disservice because Heritage Quest used to have a fantastic search um, that we no longer have access to, but still very, very useful and you can use it from anywhere. Now, Fold3 is one of those sites that you don't have access to through your library, but you might have access to it nearby at one of those other institutions. Plus, there's also the .com edition of Fold3 as well. Um, and what Fold3 is, it's largely U.S. military records. They started branching into international military records in the last few years as well. So there's a lot of Canadian, U.K., Australian um, military records in here as well. But from the American Revolution all the way up to the Vietnam War. They've got records collections that you can search. If you go to the .com, there are several collections that are free, no matter what, that you have access to anytime you want. Um, War of 1812 is one of those collections. Um, there are some other Civil War and some more modern record collections, some Vietnam record collections that are available at any time. You don't have to um, subscribe to access those. Um, these are original records that were scanned by the National Archives. So Revolutionary War pension files, yes, they're available through Heritage Quest. Heritage Quest only scanned the copies that were pertinent to military service, not the entire file. Fold3 scanned the entire file. So instead of having access to nine pages through Heritage Quest for my Jeremiah Austin, I have access to 62 pages through Fold3s because they did 
correspondence, they did fronts and backs, they did all kinds of extra paperwork. Um, specifically for Dennis, there are some Second World War collections that are in there, not anywhere near as many as we would like to see, because they consider these to still be modern um, records within human life expectancy. So casualty lists are probably one of the only things for World War II, Korea, and Vietnam you have access to. But casualty lists are different from what civilians think of as casualties. We think of casualties as deaths. Casualties in the military are illness, injury, or death. So you could search these indexes and see if somebody had the German measles, like my friend, Mr. Kessich, was in the hospital for three weeks at the start of World War II in basic training because he caught German measles. Um, Dr. Reitan, my history professor at ISU, go Redbirds, um, had gotten a shrapnel wound and survived at Anzio Beach. He shows up in the casualty records, even though both of them came home and led very long lives. Mr. Kessich passed away at 99 years old a couple of years ago. Um, so casualty lists are still important. It's the only collections we really have access to, so it's definitely worth looking at. But some other cool things that Fold3 has access to that nobody else has, um, they've got a really wonderful city directory collection. It's just for a large city, so it has Chicago. It doesn't have Springfield or Joliet. Um, it's got Indianapolis, but it doesn't have, you know, um, I just drew blank, Gary or Hammond. Um, but it, it's a good resource to use if you have family in larger cities. They also have a decent newspaper collection. They have a lot of Indiana newspapers available through Fold3. Um, Chicago Tribune, that's not the place where we're going to look for information about our family. Um, we're going to use other Chicago resources for that. And they're the only people who have the Social Security Death Index up to 2014. Everybody else stops at 2012. So it's the only place where I've got about 19 extra months um, of information on deaths that I can't really get anywhere else. Um, they have a decent Holocaust collection. It's not great, but it's still not, not bad. Um, so if you were doing research on survivors or those who perished in the Holocaust, Fold3 is a great place to go. And the reason I recommend Fold3 so much is because I'm looking at original digital images. I'm not looking at indexes like you would on Ancestry. I'm not looking at abstracts like you would on other sites. These are the original copies. So here's an example of the kinds of things they have. You have access to the federal census for free um, for 1950, um, but you also have things like those city directories. And these are scan and grayscale. They're gorgeous. I mean, they're nice and crisp. They're easy to read. They're really clear, unlike some other companies who, who scan in black and white. And you lose those photos because they just they just turn out as black. Um, and all of these are fully searchable. So I can go in and I can search um, the Baltimore City Directory or the Chicago City Directory, and it'll bring me right to the pages where the information is. But as you can see here, these are really nice, crisp, clean images that I'm looking at. And everything is downloadable. So up in the top corner, where the little, what I like to call a hammer and sickle um, are, if you click on that, everything that you find on their site is fully downloadable and can be saved to your computer. So Fold3 is one of those words, a very niche collection. They focus largely on military records. But they do have some other cool things like the newspaper collection, um, like the Social Security Death Index and the city directories that could benefit you if that's what you're looking for. I, as a .com member, I can also add things as well. And you would be able to see these if you were just browsing. So you can create, they tote themselves as Facebook for the dead. So you can create a page about an ancestor. And what it does is it populates materials from within their collections, it gives you a, a nice little timeline of, of world events, not necessarily their life, but what's going on in their lifespan. And then I can go in and I can add things. So I can tag records. I can add photos. So you could see here, somebody had uploaded two photos for this individual, one of their name on the Vietnam War Memorial, and then a picture of them um, as an individual. They could add additional documentation. Um, they can put contact information. So it's kind of cool that even if I'm not uploading information, I can see what other people are adding to kind of give a little bit more interest and in, um, human interest to certain certain pages. So Fold3 is um, it's a really good site. I highly re recommend taking a look and even browsing the free collections that are out there. 
Now you guys do have Newsbank. You have the American Newspapers collections. You might not have the historic Genealogy Bank, but um, they're very similar in nature where I can go in and I can search by person. I can search by topic. I can search by location and see what types of papers are available to me. Like I said, with the Social Security Index, everybody else stops at 2012 except for Fold 3. So again, Genealogy Bank, Ancestry, they all stop at 2012, but I would have access to it from here. So you might be able to access it through your library's subscription, but they've got papers from pre-Revolutionary War, Colonial America, all the way up into the 21st century. I just gave you a couple of the longest spanning collections um, that are available through Genealogy Bank. And as you can see, you know, some of these, you know, you've got 60 years of the Richmond Inquirer. You've got 50 years of the San Francisco Bulletin. Some of these go um, for a considerable period of time. If you're like me and you're doing research in Omaha, Nebraska, the Omaha World B is in here and it comes all the way up into the 1980s. Just depends on where you're doing your research. The reason why I like Genealogy Bank more than the other newspaper resources out there is because I don't have to put in a name. I can put in a topic or an event and it's going to search for me. So in this particular instance, like you see on your screen, I didn't search for Andrew Craig. I searched for the ship that I know he came to America um, on in 1866. So I did a search on the Caledonia and it pulled up all of the instances where a newspaper reported on the Caledonia, either leaving Glasgow, Scotland or arriving in New York Harbor. So I can find the date when the ship leaves Glasgow and arrives in New York. And then there's a newspaper article a few days later that says the ship's gonna be turning around and heading back to Glasgow on this date. So while it doesn't name my ancestor, I can still search for information about it. So events like Iroquois Theater Fire, sinking of the Titanic, um, even the Battle of the Bulge, as an example Dennis had given earlier, I'd be able to search on those. It does not have to be a person. And in some of the other sites, they don't do this all that well. And what I love about in Genealogy Bank is they have an include and an exclude. So, for example, James Craig, who's one of the ancestors I've been researching, there's also another James Craig, because it's such a common name, who was a famous Irish rebel who was fighting for independence um, in the Easter Rebellion um, in 1916 and was fighting for Irish independence until it was awarded in 1921. So when I search on James Craig, I get a ton of articles about this guy. That's not the guy I want. I want my guy who's in Nebraska. So I can go into the exclude field and put Ireland, Irish, rebel, you know, and it'll take all of those articles out. So I'm, no, I'm not slogging through 50 pages of articles about this guy. Now it's taking those out. So I'm just finding the ones I really want. So the exclude feature is the only thing um, that Genealogy Bank has that none of the others have available to you. And it's a wonderful feature. You can do the dot com. And you can, you can access the library edition. Genealogy Bank is probably the most egregious when it comes to differences between the library edition and the dot-com. And the dot-com is not that expensive. It's about $55 to $65 a year. Um, but what you can see on the screen here, the one in the back, which lives Vandalia, Edwardsville, Chicago, Belleville, that's the library edition. So we have access to those four cities in the, the library edition. Look at all the cities in the dot-com. Way more available um, through the dot-com than through the library edition. So sometimes it doesn't hurt, even if you're accessing a library edition, go to the dot-com and see if it has those cities you haven't been able to find. And even if you just have to subscribe for a month to get everything that you need out of those papers and then you unsubscribe, it's still definitely worth it to take a look and see what they have. In newspapers.com, you do have, so you do have access to this um, from home with your library card. Newspapers.com, again, does the same types of things, has newspapers from um, Revolutionary War to the present in some instances. They have a wider net, so they have five countries associated with it instead of just the U.S. like Genealogy Bank. They've got Canada, so Winnipeg, I've done research in, I can look at the Winnipeg newspapers in here. 
Northern Ireland, so the Belfast paper is in here, all over England. So I have access to London papers, Bath papers, um, York papers, um, and then Panama. And you might think, well, Panama is kind of a weird thing to throw in there. But think of how the U.S. had a 100-year lease on the Panama Canal. And all of our soldiers and sailors who were stationed in the Panama Canal District or the Panama Canal Zone, I had two people in the First World War who were stationed in Panama. I have access to those newspapers to find out about those bases. So Panama seems weird, but not if you had ancestors that were stationed down there. They have a search feature as well. You don't get the exclude button, but I can still search by, by place, by person, by name of the newspaper if I know it. One thing to keep in mind with newspapers.com is they're not really very good about showing you the issues that they have and don't have. Um, I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Um, you can clip things and save them. Always download it to your computer. Don't save it to the site itself, because if you choose to not renew, then you lose all of that data. Um, but if I go to their site, and it tells me that they have the Hayward, California newspapers, and it tells me they have the Daily Review, that doesn't necessarily mean they have a complete run of the daily review. You definitely want to make sure you're going in and looking at the little eye um, because the eye is going to tell you what's missing or what is included. So in my own research, I was looking for um, Downers Grove doings. And it said that the Downers Grove doings was a collection that was available in newspapers.com. It said, you know, it had a date range that said it was from 1921 to 1928. And I thought, that's perfect. I'm looking for an obit from 1926. I spent a half hour searching in all kinds of different ways. Couldn't find this obit and was starting to struggle thinking, did they not run an obit? What is wrong with me? Why can't I find this? When I clicked on the I, I discovered that, yes, they had 1921 to 28. But 1926 and 27 were missing. If I had just taken the time to read the info, I would have known right away that 1926 wasn't included there and would have saved myself a half hour of time and frustration. So always make sure you're looking at the info to find out exactly what's in each collection. But just like any other type of paper, it's going to bring up the entire page. You can download the entire page. You can snip just the article you want out of it. Um, Wonderful resource, scanned in grayscale. They're really nice, crisp copies. Um, and you have access to this already. So now Find My Past is one that you don't have through your library. And in fact, they just started doing a library edition. So you're better off not having the library edition because the .com includes the US and the UK newspaper collection. The library edition does not include the newspapers. So you're better off with the .com in this regard than the library edition. But the Find My Past website is largely UK material. So that would include not only what's going on in um, England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, but it's also Canada and Australia um, and other British protectorates. So there's a lot of resources here if you're doing um, British or UK research. But they've been trying to break into the, the US market. So they've got the 1950 census available through here. They've got Irish Catholic parish registers here for Baltimore, Boston, and Philadelphia. So if you have family in those areas, there's records. They have some more U.S. collections that they've added recently as well, as well as U.S. newspapers. So they've been getting into the U.S. market by buying up some of these unique collections that I don't have access anywhere else. Um, but really what's the most fun in Find My Past are their criminal records and their school records. So criminal records are um, every, I would say about once a month, Find My Past does a free weekend and they pick a collection to make available for free. So if you log, if you sign up for their newsletter, they're going to keep you aware of what's going on. Or if you follow them on Facebook or social media, they're telling you what free weekends are coming up. So one, one month, it might be school records. One month, it might be vital records. Another month, it might be pauper's records, but they do free weekends pretty regularly. And you would have the ability to go in, take a look at these collections for free during that weekend. They also have a lot of free collections. The print is super duper tiny. If you scroll down to the bottom of their page, it'll say browse our free collections. Almost like they really want to make you work to find them. Um, but they do have lots of free collections that you can browse as well. Um, but if you click on search our records, you can see what types of materials that they cover. Here's one of those criminal records. Um, so everybody thinks, ah, my family weren't 
ever criminals. They were all perfectly lovely, upstanding individuals. Well, in my family, um, I had one who um, got arrested a lot for larceny, even against his own brother. So up across the top, I could see James Fogg tells me that he works in a cotton factory, you know, gives me his address, tells me that he was arrested for stealing from his brother, John Fogg, and tells me what he stole, that he took 30 shillings and a couple of other things, um, that he pled guilty, and here's how much time he served. All of those handwritten transcriptions underneath, James got arrested again and again and again. And until the next edition of the book was published, where it was all in print, somebody hand wrote all of the extra times that he was arrested. Or Eliza Shore Rocks, she was arrested three more times as well. Um, so sometimes it's fun to just go in and see if any family members um, show up in here. But things that we don't think of as being criminal in the 21st century was illegal there. Being poor was illegal and you could be thrown in jail for it. Um, poaching rabbits, um, getting caught fishing on the the estate on the the uh you know vector's land you know the estate land so types of things that we wouldn't think of as being a crime show up in these types of records so these are great they're available through find my past they're fun to search they also have school records us hasn't really done a great job of making school records available the school districts conducted censuses every year for students um and while a lot of communities still have these records, they just really haven't made their way online yet. Um, but Find My Past made these available for British schools. So you can see here, here's just one page. This is the Fogg family again, but it gives me the name of the student. It gives me the exact birth date of the student, tells me where they are in school, what, what level, what class they're in, gives me the name of their father and the occupation. And these are done every year. So instead of having to wait 10 years for the census or wait until the next federal or government record comes out, these are available year after year after year. So I can see as new students start, as students age out, as families move, these records are fantastic. And I really wish we had these available for us here in the States. Again, they've got newspapers too. They've got a lot of US items that they're adding to the collection. So if you haven't used it before, go in and poke around a little bit and see what you think. So now I want to talk about some free websites, some you're probably familiar with and some you may not have used before. Um, I think most of us um, hopefully have heard of Carly. You guys can confirm or deny. So Carly is the, the Collections um, College Academic Research Libraries of Illinois. And what that means is that this website is designed for academic libraries to house their digital collections. And there are some digital collections in here that are very, very useful and important to our genealogy. So if you haven't gone out and used Carly before, poke around and see what you think. But they have things from like, um, there was a Naval Aviation Training Center in Monmouth, Illinois, which is kind of amusing because it's nowhere near water. But this is where they were teaching pilots how to fly um, at the start of the Second World War. Those records are in here. I can find county um, township tax records in here. I can find all kinds of maps and um, uh, city directories and resources available in here. There's a lot of Illinois, as well as outside of Illinois, but largely homegrown Illinois records that are available through Carly that live in our academic libraries. So whether it's Northwestern University, whether it's um, Illinois State University, Elmhurst College, SIU, whatever it happens to be, I can search by the institution. I can just do a general keyword search. I can search by the type of media. Do I only want photographs or do I want, um, do I want texts? Do I want newspapers? Do I want magazines? And I can sort that way as well. Um, I did a search by topic. So I think when I was searching in here, I was looking for the name McCormick when I did my search. And it shows me all of the different types of records that show up with that keyword in my search. And you can see it's a pretty wide range of things. I've got college newspapers. I've got um, advertisements. I've got magazines. I've got all kinds of stuff in here. It shows me the date ranges. I can I can filter my dates. I can filter who the creator is. I might only want things that are coming from 
um, Illinois Department of Public Health or um, Edwards, the University of Illinois at Edwardsville, I can sort by who the creator is. Um, but you're looking at a lot of original digital images. So it's it's a fun collection if you're doing Illinois research to go in and take a look and see what it has for your relatives, your family, your county, your community, and see what's out there. You can download. So like, for example, we've got a collection um, that's in Ida, Illinois, which I'll talk about in just a second, where we've scanned the entire book and made it available as a PDF. Carly did the exact same thing. So if you find volumes of something, whether it's a county atlas, whether in this case, it's a tax assessor's book for Moni Township, I can go in and I can download the entire book and look at the PDF just as if I had it in front of me. Um, so as you're working through these records, for like the Navy records, for example, it's the whole file. So I'm not looking at a stagnant image. It might be a 13 page file. I can download that whole file and save it to my computer. So here's what I did. I did a search. I clicked on um, download. There's a little icon in the upper right hand corner and it asks me, do you want the whole PDF? Absolutely, I want the whole PDF. And I saved it to my computer so I could go through it. I'm going to talk about Internet Archive, and then I'm going to talk about Ida, Illinois. How many of you have used Internet Archive? Internet Archive is one of my absolutely favorite sites. It's 100% free. It does not cause you a cent to use it, but it is probably one of the most useful historic websites that I've ever used. They are not genealogists. They are not a genealogy database like Ancestry or Find My Past. But the amount of genealogy information in it is priceless. So they're historians and they're digitizing books and resources and um, movie reels and network broadcasts and sound recordings. Um, if you can think of it, it's probably in here. They have a huge 1930s film noir collection where I can download and watch the Maltese Falcon in its entirety. I can listen to an entire album by Al Jolson. I can listen to, if you're a fan of the band Chicago, Chicago's entire record um, collection is available in here. Grateful Dead, like it, there's a lot in it than just stagnant texts and documents. Um, like I said, there's feature films, there's documentaries, there's First World War um, war films that are in here that were done by the um, Army Corps of Engineers. Lots of other things besides just photos and books. Um, but what's really cool about it is they have huge microfilm collections. So all of the U.S. censuses up until 1920 are in here. I can download reel by reel and go through them just as if I was sitting in a microfilm machine. Um, I had Canadian homesteaders. All of the reels for Alberta, Canada for Canadian homesteaders are in here. I was able to find my ancestors' um, Canadian homestead application in there. They've got all kinds of newspapers available in here as well, both in Illinois as well as outside of Illinois, um, as well as the ability to search inside all of the books within their collections. So when you go to their site, it tells you how big, how many things do they have in each category. So I can see that they've got over 2 million um, videos and movies that they have over 78 mil or 7.8 million microfilm read um, reels that they have over you know 34 million books available in their collection if i'm not quite sure what i'm looking for i can browse by category so american libraries are in here so i can browse what other libraries have like boston public library newberry library in chicago um lots of academic libraries carly is wrapped into this as well so i can get to carly from here those music collections I talked about, the newspaper and microfilm collections, I could browse as well. Um, but underneath where I've got the red circle, where you've got the search box, I can put in my term. So I can say I'm looking for George K. Middleton, and I can do a search. What it's going to do is it's going to look for George K. or Middleton. It's not going to limit it. It's going to bring up any of those search terms. But if I go to advanced search, I can be a little bit more specific in what I'm looking for. So I could put in Danville, comma, Illinois, and it's going to look for Danville or Illinois. But if I go into advanced search, I can put that in quotes. So it only looks for Danville, Illinois, 
Or the even better feature in that is it defaults to the metadata fields. And metadata is just a very fancy way of saying tags. So metadata, there's five fields of metadata that um, Internet Archive defaults to, and it's title, author, publisher, publisher location, and date. So if I search for Danville, Illinois, it's looking for Danville, Illinois as publisher, title, location. Um, after I do my search, so on this screen, I haven't done a search yet, so it doesn't pop up for you. But after I do my search, when it brings up your results, there are two little radio buttons. The first one defaults to metadata, so it's looking for those five fields. Underneath that, it says search inside all text. And what that means is it's now going to go through and read all 30 million volumes that they have and look for Danville, Illinois. So if you have not done this before, this is absolutely a game changer in your research because I might not have known that I was looking for a county history for a family member in Oregon because I didn't know that that's where they went. But in their county history, they list that they came from Plainfield, Illinois. So Plainfield, Illinois pings against a book in another state or another country because it's referencing somebody's birthplace or where they got married or where their parents were from or where they're from, whatever the instance is. So search all texts really is a game changer in your research. So here's a screenshot of, of that, those most popular collections. So you could see American libraries have 3.5 million items within their collection. We're totally beating the Canadians who only have, you know, 700,000 in there. Um, but if you were to click on that, it would expand and show you all of the libraries that are within that collection. So I can see that, you know, I've got academic libraries, I've got public libraries, I've got all kinds of things in there. As I mentioned, Carly is within this collection. So I can see ISU has 579 items. I can see Drew University has 768 items. And off to the side, it tells me what those items are. Sometimes it's newspapers, like college newspapers. Sometimes it's college yearbooks or um, annuals or, or um, rosters, phone book directories for the university. But sometimes you get a whole wide range of things. So if you look in the bottom corner, it tells me that there are 827 Methodist church records available in here. Those can be vital records, right? Those could be baptisms, marriages, and deaths. Those could be church construction. That could be um, annual lists of Methodist ministers. So if you have Methodists in your family, going in and looking at Carly's collection on Methodist church records could break open some avenues of research for you. And again, you see the radio button up in the corner that I was talking about? This is just looking for that as those five fields. If I were to switch my results to search all text contents, that number is gonna be way, way higher than the 15,000 that I'm seeing on the screen right now. It would show me a lot of additional resources that come up because it's reading inside those texts. So now text all contents only works for their actual text documents. It does not include newspapers. It does not include microfilms. So it's not gonna read the microfilm. It's not gonna read um, broadcasts or, or, or sound recordings or, or videos or movies. It's just looking for books. So you'd still have to search the newspapers. You would still have to search the microfilm. But this is looking inside all of the books within their collection. Here's another example of that. I was searching for Elmhurst, and it showed me that Elmhurst University had a collection of yearbooks that were available, and it shows me the years. I can download any of these volumes and save them to my computer and browse through those PDFs page by page by page. Um, you can see that there's a hundred different yearbooks to go through. Again, I could put a search in the collection and put in a particular name or a particular place name and it would bring it up in the collection for me. Um, and it shows me the ranges of years that are covered. And here's what it looks like internally. All of these little dots. So I did a search on Jones once I opened up the book to take a look at it. And it tells me that all those little blue hashtags across the bottom are all of the places where the name Jones shows up in the yearbook. And on the left-hand side, it shows me 
a snippet of the text to decide if that's the right Jones that I'm looking for. So I might say, no, page 42 is not right, but page 43 is my, my Jones. And I can click on that and it will take me right to that page. And then if that is my person and I want to save it, I can download it to my computer so that I have access to it. So these are all original full copies. A lot of them are scanned in full color, like you can see here. And all of that is open for me to download and save for my research. So I was talking a little earlier um, before we got started about war diaries and about um, company clerk records. There's a lot of military diaries that are available through Internet Archive as well. Um, so things like you know, the history of the fourth division or um, the big red one, which is the first division, um, which is Cantini Museum here in um, Wheaton, Illinois. Um, there's whole histories that are in there available to download. Yearbooks, um, church inventories and books, all kinds of stuff. So again, go in, search on your community, search on your family surname and see what comes up. The downside is that everything, not everything matches identically. So for example, I can search on search inside all texts and I can search for Plainfield, Illinois, and it's gonna search for Plainfield, Illinois. But I could say search for Plainfield IL and I'm gonna get different results. I can tell it search for Plainfield ILL and I'm gonna get different results, right? So George Middleton, George K. Middleton, G. K. Middleton, G. Middleton, all of those different ways. Think of how many different ways you can say cemetery, you know, cemetery, burial ground, um, kirkyard, graveyard. Yeah, it's how you have to search Internet Archive because not every book is going to use the same term. So you want to make sure that you're searching a whole variety of um, options when you search it. But I guarantee you, none of you are going to be disappointed every one of you is going to find a resource that mentions your family in it. Family search, has anybody not used Family Search? Family Search is another one of those free sites that's global. It's sponsored by the Church of Latter-day Saints, um, formerly known as Mormons, um, where you have access to millions of pages of original digital content at no charge. So you have access to their family tree, you have access to original vital records, military records, land records, probate records. If you can think of it, it's in there. You have access to their family history centers or their affiliated libraries. Like my library is an affiliated library. So I have access to their digital collections, just like their history centers are. They have a really good blog telling you about what's new and what's been updated in their collection. But probably my two favorite things in the collection is the research wiki and their book collection. So the research wiki, I mentioned Ancestry's help features earlier, where I can go into Ancestry's help feature to learn more about railroad records, but they're only railroad records that Ancestry has. Family Search's research wiki will tell you how to research railroad records. And if another organization or another company has records, they'll give you the link to that page. So as you're looking at the research wiki and family search, it's not uncommon to see, here's the link to find a grave. Here's the link to um, my heritage. Here's the link to find my past because they just want you to be able to find the records. They don't want you to just search their records. So if you haven't taken advantage of the wiki, it's truly remarkable the amount of information that's available in there, regardless of what the subject is. And I'm going to show you an example in just a second. There are user submitted photo collections. They're not really very searchable. So when I search on Craig, it shows me all the Craigs. I can't limit it by state or country or name, um, but they're still there and available to you. Um, and then access to the card catalog if you're an affiliate library is outstanding. Um, so when you go to search, here are our options. Most of us just jump right into records collections so that we're searching their every name databases that they have created. But again, research wiki is at the bottom and the book collection is down there too. So while Internet Archive has a tremendous number of books, the book collection on FamilySearch is much more recent. It comes all the way up into the 2000s, and it's a lot of things that are genealogically specific. So those cemetery and, and tombstone readings that local organizations do, county probate records, family newsletters, and family histories, those are the kinds of things that show up in the book collection at Family Search. Whereas in Internet Archive, it's just any book. So it could be on 
astrophysics. It could be on geometry. This is genealogical specifically. Um, so take a look at the book collection if you haven't done that in a while. So here's the wiki. I did a search on Foggia because I was helping a lady do research in Italy and she wanted to see what types of records were available. So it shows me everything that um, they have within their collection. It gives me the top 100 words in Italian. So if I didn't speak Italian, I'd be able to see what the word for birth and death is, what the days of the week, the numbers, the, the months of the year are. And that's for multiple languages. Um, it shows me on the right hand side the types of records that are collected. So if I'm looking for school records, it tells me click on school records and it's going to tell, tell me the type of school records they collected in Italy. If you don't see the category there, it's probably because that region or that state or that county didn't collect that type of record. Um, but as you scroll down, if I'm not finding an answer or if I have a specific question, there's a little button at the bottom that says ask the community that goes out to everybody. And usually people are pretty quick to respond. So if you're saying, well, I'm doing research on FOGIA, but I'm looking for this specifically, somebody's going to respond back to you and tell you whether it exists. And if it does, where can you find it? So absolutely an amazing resource, no matter what you're researching, whether it's U.S. or foreign, whether it's, you know, things like church records or, or, or occupational records, somebody's going to have it in the wiki and you're going to be able to find more information on it. And then it also tells me, well, here's what we have. If you want to look at our Italian online records, I can click that link. And it takes me into their website and shows me the collections. So in this particular case, I'm in the catalog. And I did a search on Foggia. And it tells me, here are the different records collections that we have for the county of Foggia. It tells me there are 105 different collections, not records, not individual standalone records, but collections. And each one of these collections might have 15, 20, 30, 100 years worth of data inside of it. So I clicked on just one of them. It tells me that there's already an online index where I can do a search for the surname I'm looking for. So I could click on that red, that red, um, sentence and it'll take me right to the digital collection for me to search or I can browse by year and if it has a little camera it means that it's available and I can view it from home and it's open and accessible and what that does is it brings up the microfilm reel and I can go through it page by page by page just like if I was sitting in front of the reel but I can search 1909 1809 to 1818 1818 to 1827 and by decade I'm looking at these types of vital records so if you haven't looked at the catalog before, you can find a lot of original reels that you can browse um, that are available for you for free from home as well. So lastly, I wanna talk about Illinois Digital Ar Archives. Hopefully some of you have been using Ida Illinois in your research. Um, Ida is sponsored by the State Library. Just, oh, I gotta update my screenshot now because now that Alexa Giannullius is our Secretary of State, they actually just removed um, Jesse White's name, like they just took that field out to make it easier. <laughs> so they didn't have to update thousands of web pages. Um, but Ida Illinois is designed by libraries for, for patrons, for users. So Plainfield Library has two collections in there, Naperville Library, Illinois State Library, State Archives in Springfield, um, Anna Public Library, um, all over the, the state of Illinois. They're arranged by category, so I can search for railroad records, Illinois maps, oral histories, military records, land records, city directories and phone books, whatever it happens to be. Or I can just browse. I can browse by collection. I can browse by institution if I just want to see what the Illinois State Archives made available, or if I just want to see what um, uh, Mc uh, McLean County Genealogical Society made available. I can go in and I can do that or I could just search by keyword. So I had done a keyword search on Lombard and it brought up all of the different records that mention Lombard. Postcards, um, newspaper articles talking about Lombard citizens, a whole variety of things. And I can go through what I'm looking for. There are full runs of newspapers in here. We've got five different Elgin newspapers. We've got the Stalker, which I think is the best genealogical society um, newsletter name ever. Um, the Chicago um, Genealogical Society's newsletters, uh, quarterlies are in here. Um, 
Chicago Jewish Sentinel for about 60 years is in here, and that was national. Talked about um, Jews all across the United States, not just in Chicago. Um, lots of different maps and photo collections are in here as well. Definitely worth taking the time to, to dig around and see what you can find. So I did a search on Plainfield in this instance, and it shows me all of the different places where Plainfield pops up. It always tells me the collection and the subject off to the far left. So if I wanted to narrow my search, I can certainly do that. I highly recommend you do this simply because Elgin newspapers are going to clog your feed. So no matter what topic you put in, whether it's a name of a town, the name of a person, an occupation, Elgin is going to be your first five pages of results. Go into the collections, especially if you're not looking for Elgin. Go into the collections and uncheck Elgin to save yourself some time because it's such a large collection. It just it kind of takes up most of your search. It's like that exclude feature in Genealogy Bank. Um, but then I can go through and I can click through and view original materials. Like I said, we digitized full books. So Plainfield Village Trust, uh, Treasurer's Book, 1928 to 1946. I can click on that and download the entire PDF. So somebody would have access to the whole book. A lot of these have full transcriptions. So when you put the name into the advanced search, if it's in the text and somebody has transcribed it, it's going to pop up for you. And it's going to take you right to the page within the volume where that name shows up. Um, because these are all done by universities, libraries, museums, and organizations, each one has set its own copyright standard. So if you find something you're interested in, definitely make sure you scroll down to the bottom for rights and permissions to find out what, you, what your usage is. Can I use it for, for personal use? Am I allowed to repost it? Um, just look at what the, the standards are if you want to share something online. So I clicked on that volume. Here are all of the pages. I can go through it image by image by image, or I can just download the entire thing. It's one of those that most people haven't used before. Um, and I'm only gonna spend two minutes talking about Archive Grid and then we'll be done. Um, Archive Grid is the, the best website for how to find what you don't know. How do I know what I don't know? Archive Grid tells me that. So in the library world, we're very familiar with WorldCat, which is the World Catalog, and that is for printed textual documents. So if I'm looking for a book and my library doesn't have it, I can go into WorldCat, find a library that has it, and then request it be sent to my library if it's available. Archive Grid is run by the same company that runs WorldCat, but it's for loose paper manuscripts and genealogy and textual documents, loose documents, not for bound volumes. So think of things like personal diaries, um, letters and correspondence, um, other types of documentation, whether it's employment records or, or, or um, railroad records or township tax inventories or whatever it happens to be. Archive Grid has these, and they're, they're archives, they're museums, they're public institutions, they're, they're federal repositories that have these collections um, within their institution. So I can search by my topic, I can do a keyword search, I can just browse by location to see what might be available in Vermilion County or what might be available in, in Kane County. It shows me all of the collections within that area. It gives me links back to the original institution. So these are just finding aids and their inventories. They're not original documents. There are some in there, but it's a way for me to find out, does my name, does the surname, does the cemetery, does the, the collection, does the military unit, does the company my grandpa worked for show up in some of these records? And it allows me to find out where they are. So for example, I did a search on vaudeville. My, my friend is writing a book on the history of early vaudeville in Illinois. So he wanted to know what types of vaudeville collections existed in the world. And outside of ISU, go Redbirds, um, we have the, the Circus and Allied Arts collection at ISU, which includes vaudeville at Milner Library. I knew that collection existed. 
So I had recommended it to him. But I also found out that there were vaudeville collections in Baraboo, Wisconsin, in at University of Arizona in Tucson, and that there were collections in California as well. So through the course of my research, I did a search on vaudeville. It brought up people who were involved in vaudeville. So I could see that I've got George Manna. I can see that I have Hardly Sadler. And I could see that I have Ed Wynn. All right, tell me you guys know who Ed Wynn is. Hopefully there's some nods. So there are 26, I think it's 26, it might be 29, different collections that mention actor and vaudevillian Ed Wynn. And if I were to click on his name, it would show me all of those different places where there was materials related to him. It could either be his personal collection, letters about him, photos or, or film of, that he was in, all of those different things show up in this collection. And before I click to the next screen, you could see the geographical areas. So there are vaudeville records in the US, in Australia, in England, as well as locally, California, and some other you know local communities, New York State. I can see what types of archives have them, right? I can see that the New York Public Library has some, the Danish Library Center, the National Library of Australia, and topics. Am I looking for vaudeville? Am I looking for entertainers? Am I looking for actors? Am I looking for you know, entertainers? And I can play with my search through there. So Edwin actually donated his personal papers um, to the University of California. Um, and I can see, here's a description, that we have the original records related to him that go all the way up to 1966, um, that the bulk of them are from 1930 to 1938, um, that it's one box, that it's 24 oversized um, like smaller boxes within that collection. Um, there's a finding aid that explains what's in each box. I can click in the upper right-hand corner on that PDF and download the finding aid. So it might list correspondences and who they're to. It might list films that he had done, you know, that they have in their collection. It might have personal things like birth records, marriage records, death records within there. And it's going to tell me in that finding aid exactly what it is they have. Then there's a link that takes me to the University of California to where I can contact them and ask for copies or ask for more information. So I absolutely love Archive Grid for kind of, you know, lifting the veil on all of the places where information can live. So I could do a search on George Middleton and I might find out that he had written letters to a cousin in Ohio and those records wound up at the Ohio history center or at you know the university of akron or whatever it happens to be or george was in the 18th wisconsin um army during the the civil war where are records related to the 18th wisconsin company a and it's going to show me all of the places where those records exist so there's a lot of individual everyday normal human beings who show up in archive grid just because of correspondences and groups they might have belonged to or universities they might have attended. So Archive Grid is one of those great, I don't want to say last resort, but definitely one of those places where you want to look when you've exhausted what's available online. But I want to see if there's something out there that's, you know, not online, but I still can reach out to and access information. Absolutely love um, using Archive Grid for that. I'm not going to go into Google because we've all used Google in our family tree, but probably the three most important things about Google are using Google Books, Google Maps, and Google Newspapers. Yes, it's great to put in my surname and see all of the different places where it comes up, but when I want to target my research and I want to look for specific things, using Google Books, Google Maps, and Google Newspapers are the best three uses for Google as a whole. And in your handout, you have the link to Google News. It has not been updated since 2011. Um, that's when they stopped funding it and adding more newspapers. But there are full runs of newspapers in here across the country, all over the world. There are German newspapers, French newspapers, Canadian newspapers in here. The downside is it's done by the name of the newspaper, not the geographic reason, uh, um, location. So if I put in Aurora, is it Aurora, Illinois or Aurora, Colorado? 
if I put in Ottawa, is it Ottawa, Illinois or Ottawa, Canada? And in fact, all four of those places are in here. So you kind of have to know the name of the newspaper to really get anything out of this. But the, the original digital content, you're looking at the original newspaper. It's not an index, it's not an abstract, but it is free and it is accessible to you. So definitely go in and see what newspapers are in there that might benefit your research. Here's what that looks like. So, you know, the advocate could be anywhere, right? The the album Universal could, where is that? So when you click on it, sometimes you could look at the header to see what location it's in. Um, but if you kind of know what your community's newspapers were called, you can go in and you can look for them that way. But you can see we have um, 1906 to 1917, 1903 to 1915, 1862 to 1870. Again, it doesn't mean it's every issue and that it's every year. You've got to click into it to see what the nuances are, what's missing and what's not missing. But I can I can browse by day, by month or by week. So if I just want to see all the papers for the month to see what's missing, I can search it that way or daily. Google Maps is a great resource, too, because not only can I do a Google Street View and drive past great grandma's house, but I could also use it to see inside of buildings. So things like the Smithsonian Institute, you know, Library of Congress. Here's my library where you can kind of like a dollhouse, take the roof off and see inside my building. So you can see where my reference desk is and where my local history collection lives. Um, so Google Maps are kind of cool for being able to like, you know, dollhouse, lift off the lid and look inside for those public buildings. You guys have all of these in your handout already. You don't need to jot any of these down. These already exist for you in print. Sign up for a genealogy blog. Follow somebody, um, whether it's Dick Eastman, whether it's um, Dear Myrtle, whether it's, um, I just drew a blank on her first name, Johnson Crow, whoever it happens to be, because they're always talking about new collections, new webinars, new conferences that are coming up, so you can always find um, new ideas. You guys already have in your handout the digitized newspaper collection. So these are just some more of ones that I mentioned today. Illinois Resources, you already have these. I already talked about most of these today. They are also in your guide. Um, just some ideas of things to look out for. Um, research libraries. I mean, you guys have access to, you know, Ileana Genealogical Society, as well as the wonderful archives that Melody has there at Danville already. And then some useful tools, you have these as well. Um, birth date calculators. Um, uh, if you have Jewish ancestry, the, the Hebrew calendar dates. Stephen Morris did a really good index to Ellis Island and Castle Garden. He also did a great one for the 1950 census if you're still looking for people there. Um, so all of those are places to go for extra information. Again, you have all of these in the resource guide, that, that eight page booklet that you have access to as well. So won't go into those. You guys already have all of these available to you. So I'm happy to answer any questions if you had something specific I didn't cover. Or if you have a website that you use all the time that you absolutely love, I would love to hear about it. Okay, so you would think that the closer to my grandparents would be the easiest information to find. Being it was just you know a few decades ago, but it's the hardest I seem to find. And what's driving me insane is I'm on Ancestry.com, and a lot of family trees on there are wrong. They're just oh. wrong. yeah. I the, you know, I'm a genealogical genius, but if you look at actually read the census, people are picking them up as like, well, that was their daughter. No, it says on there their granddaughter. They said that their grandparents and their parents died when they were real. So everything in that tree is wrong. Yeah. You try yourself insane trying to find out the specific correct information. Yeah. And you're wrong. I'm not wrong. I'm not crazy. <laughs> Yeah, no, you are absolutely right. I have, um, I do re research on McClure's and I had one lady who had the McClure's in South Carolina and lost them in Illinois. And I had them in Illinois, but didn't have them in South Carolina. And I went and did research in South Carolina and I came back and I said, your tree's wrong. I said, you have the wrong John McClure is the Patriot. You're, you're up a generation. You need to be over. It was his, it was his 
nephew that was the one she had. She refused to hear it. I had a birth record. I had a marriage record. I had the, the service record. It didn't matter. She was not going to change her tree. And unfortunately, there were six other people who tagged to her because they thought hers was right. There's nothing we can do about it. Really and truly, the trees on Ancestry, and heaven forbid, you try to use the trees in family search, it'll drive you insane because anybody can change anything. I can go in and change any family I want because it's all open source and it's accessible to anybody. So I don't put any information in the family search world tree um, because it, it just, it frustrates me so much. Best thing you can use, use it as a guide, not a fact, and just take the information they provide and verify it through legitimate sources. And then just acknowledge the fact that theirs is wrong. And, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people are new. A lot of people in ancestry aren't experts, you know, so they're just following the little leaf, right? And they're just clicking along and not realizing that's not the right person. They just have yeah. the same name. So yeah, the trees in ancestry or in family search are not anything I put any credence in because the ones that are usually truly accurate are the ones that are private. Yeah, there's that. But how do you distinguish, like, well, I mean, my tree, everybody's a Mary or a William or a Nicholas or a John. It's like, mm -hmm. And they distinguish with middle initials or spelling out the middle name. Yeah. Okay, well, they were in Pennsylvania, but then they were in the Civil War and now they're in Virginia. And how do you, I, I lose track of them along the line. It's like if they don't narrow it down to a specific town or a county, how do you know which land probates are theirs or which I know. either the tax assessments or and then the census before 1840 really yeah. are or yeah. <laughs> it, it's it's just having a per, you know a preponderance of information. So I have several folders on my computer for suspected family members. Right. Because, all right, I've got I've got Craig's. Oh, my God, there's Craig's everywhere. Right. You know, John has James who has John who has James who has John who has James. How do I know which one is which? Not to mention all of the other brothers and cousins who are having Johns's and James's and Johns's and James's. Um, so I have several folders of this could be, you know, or this probably is family. And it's really just a preponderance of information, every single piece. So if it's a probate that has a, a family airship page in it because not all of them do which is giving me you know birth dates and names of of siblings um church records are a great resource because you're going to get whole family group sheets together um those school censuses that the u.s is terrible at putting online will list head of households so really it's just amassing too much information about each person until you have enough proof to say with any doubt yes this is them um but it's not easy. I mean, truly, it takes a lifetime to make sure that as I'm following my McClure's from Scotland to Pennsylvania to Cowpens, Virginia to Mecklenburg, North Carolina, how do I know I've got the right people? Because I just drowned myself in 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 primary sources until I'm certain. Um, so if you have somebody who's an outlier who winds up in a weird spot and you're like, how on earth did they wind up in Alexander County? I save it. It goes into that folder until I find something that says a probate that says, you know, here are all the children. And, oh, there's John McClure living in in, in Illinois. And I'm like, ha, 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 there's my guy. I'm moving him back over into the family tree. So it truly takes a lifetime. It's to the best you can. What you've got. But why is it, it is. so hard? Like my grandparents, my great grandparents on both sides, my mom and my dad. It's nearly impossible to find anything out of them. I'm like, why? They just, you know, they died in the 90s. You wouldn't think it'd be that hard to find, but it truly is. Modern records are a little bit harder just simply because, you know, most government records are sealed for a period of time. Like in Illinois, deaths are 20 years, marriages are 50 years, and births are 75 years. So if I'm looking for a marriage through the state, I'm not going to get it unless they're married after 1970 or before 1970, right? They had to die before 2001 for me to have. And that's to contact the county for it. It's not even digitized and available online. Um, but like, for example, in the state of Illinois, the state archives just released an amended um, death index. So 
historically it went from 1916 to 1950. They just put out 1951 and 1971. So I was able to go in and find a bunch of people that I was missing, waiting, waiting for that information to become available online. And that's available through the Secretary of State's website. But I mean, truly, you're right. I mean, it, it it's it's not easy. Um, but that's where you're doing a lot of in-person research at that point for modern records. I'm going to the courthouse and I'm looking at land records. I'm going through the courthouse, I'm looking for probate records. And you know, the more modern ones, I've got to I've got to go there to view in person because they're not online yet. So I've got to make that trip to the to the courthouse to take a look. Or does the courthouse have, you know, a birth index or a death index? Can I take a look at it and see what's out there? But I mean, I sympathize my my Middletons for a long, long time. His wife, um, there was nothing on the Brooks and the Page family. I mean, I still struggle to even pinpoint where in Delaware they're from, Delaware and Rhode Island, um, I still don't know. And I've been doing this for 30 years. So, I mean, it's just, sometimes it's hard, but truly go out to Internet Archive because I think you're going to be shocked by what you find. Um, just because how do you know what you don't know, right? This is where I'm at an archive grid or where I'm going to go to find that stuff where it's like, oh, I didn't realize that even existed. Now it's helping me answer my brick walls. Well, this helps because I was very keen in my scope using Ancestry and a little bit of the heritage and uh, trying to Google and look through like newspapers that you could find online. But exactly. So, I will check these out for sure, but I appreciate it. So, yeah. What do you think of WikiTree? It's true, where it's just kind of open source and anybody has access to it. It's any of these places would be a good source of clues, but I would definitely want to verify it with official sources. So anybody can put something up there that says like, I could say I'm related to the Queen of Sheba. There's nobody to say I'm not. Um, it would be your job to verify the, the claims that I was making by looking for birth records, probate records land records, church records, whatever it happens to be. So any of these collective trees that you see, uh, genie.com is another one um, of, of family trees that are out there. You know, it's it's our job if I want to use that information to use it as just a clue. Doesn't mean it's fact until I verify it with my own research. So on ancestry, um, I do the pay thing. And, but when you click on like some of the the land ownerships mm -hmm. and also uh, the wills, it, you don't get the screenshot as what it was. It just comes like a generic uh, place. So there's nothing to look at really. They just exactly. Have yeah, and Ancestry is notorious for that. They are notorious for having indexes and abstracts with no original digital image, and that shows up a lot in some of their older collections, but. What I can do is if you look at that collection at the very bottom of the page, it gives you the source citation. So it gives you the exact name of the location and where they found it. I'm going to take that information and go into family search and plug it in and see if they've already scanned the original images and, and look at the original source. So I take a lot of things out of other sources to see if they're available in family search. So like Scotland's places or Scotland's people, I can go and search the index for free and get a birth date in a location and then go in the family search, pull up the original microfilm and find it to see if it's my people. So I use family searches a lot to like cherry pick out of other indexes to look for the original source. So I would probably look for that will. Um, the original, the scan of it in family search and see if it's there. Or the county, like the local genealogical society where that is, maybe they've already done it. Do we have any other questions? My email address is on the front of my handout. So as you're working through it, if you have questions or, hey, where do I go for this? Or what do you think of that? send me an email. I'm happy to, to keep working with you and help answer your questions. And of course, when, even though you have your home edition of Ancestry.com, you can come and work on it 
here, you know, accessing it through our computers or bring a laptop in. And if you work with us and ask us questions as you go along, Deanne and I are both, you know, very willing to help and say we can find we can find this book for you. We can get that in the library. library. We have it, or uh, we also are an affiliate library team, and so yeah, um, we have access to some of the digital images that on um, on um, Family Search this may be useful to you. You can bring a list to the. And, and we're good to... listeners, right? Melody's a good listener. Yeah, she'll help. Probably... She'll help give you suggestions. People that are experienced, but you know, we're referencing archives, so we can get you books and everything, even if we don't have it or see if it's available. Now, I'm great for online. I published or you know made list of all of our Vermilion County histories are on archive.org. Um, yeah. So I have a list here. If you want to look up something? Sure. Our, our we have a local surname index, but if you're looking for a certain church or uh, some other and something you want to look in our Vermillion County histories, it's much easier to go online where you can mm -hmm. search the entire book. And that's what we do, you know, when we're looking for something, is it in this history or that one, whatever. If they're digitized, it makes it so much easier to have them yeah. because they're searchable. They're digitized, they're searchable. Right. Mm -hmm. I heard you guys were getting ready to ship all these involved. So how long will they be without your 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 microphone and stuff? We don't know yet. We're working on it. We're working on having our microfilm digitized, Tina. Mm -hmm. So how long? Our of course, our best one would be if they could do it here. We'll have you set up shop here and you could digitize it here. But uh, we're still working out. We did get the funding just recently for all That's of our wonderful. Just wonderful. This yeah. excellent. And, so I do have hopes of some time while I'm still working at the library that we'll have it digitized and have it available for uh, use for not just us, but the, the staff, but the patrons. So it would be just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I think I'm good. Okay. <laughs> There's anything right. else? All right, everybody. Thank you. No, Thank it was you. so good to see all of you. I love that you're, um, you know, you're in Illinois and you emphasize the Illinois resources. And of course, your handouts are just wonderful with all the um, citations of, of, you know, where the websites are. So thank you very much. Well, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day and happy hunting. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the information. Thanks. All right. Have a good one. Bye-bye now.